All right, so the last segment of our talk about Chapter 12, the cell cycle, is we're going to focus on how the cell cycle is regulated. All right, so you want to read over uh, Chapter 11. All right, so there are certain page numbers and sections that you'll want to look over because the information provided in this chapter will help explain what's taking place during this regulation process. All right, it's information we're not going to spend a lot of time on. Um, but it does provide you with the necessary background information you do need. You want to focus your attention mostly on this here. Protein phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. All right, because this is going to apply to our cell cycle regulation. All right, so kind of giving you an overview of this material in that particular uh, chapter. Cells communicate with one another by means of chemical signals. For the receiving cell, there are three stages in the signaling process. Reception, transduction, and cell response. The cell targeted by a particular signal has a receptor molecule complementary to the signal molecule or ligand. The ligand fits like a key in a lock and triggers a change in the receptor molecule. Signal transduction converts the change in the receptor to a form that can bring about a cellular response. This might involve a series of steps, a signal transduction pathway that alters and amplifies the change. In the third stage of cell signaling, the transduction process brings about a cellular response. This can be any of many different cellular activities, such as activation of a certain enzyme, rearrangement of the cytoskeleton, or activation of specific genes. Okay, so what we're basically talking about in terms of cell signaling, we're talking about how the cell is basically obtaining information from its environment. All right, you can have cell A talk to cell B, for instance, or you have you can have nutrients, chemicals, proteins out in the environment, extracellular milieu of the environment that come to contact or set with specific receptors on the surface of the cell that communicate the presence of that particular item and the cell responds all right, in form, following that interaction between your, your ligand, your substrate, and your protein receptor. All right, so there are three main stages as that video outlined. You have the interaction between your ligand, your substrate, and your receptor molecule, so reception, or the detection of this extracellular signal. Or it could be it could be an internal signal as well. Um, you have the information that's being transferred from this receptor protein to ultimately the nucleus of the cell, ultimately to the genome. All right, so you have this transduction, this passage of information from the extracellular environment to the internal environment of the cell, all right, the nucleus, all right, to the signal transduction pathway. All right, and lastly, the cell responds to this, this interaction. All right, so this kind of gives you a nice outline. You have a ligand. All right, so for instance, since we're talking about cell cycle, this could be a growth factor that binds to a specific receptor. All right, this growth factor being your ligand. Bind to a receptor, the information of this interaction is gonna be transferred, transduced, through a, a series of internal proteins. All right, so here you have signal uh, transduction, all right, to ultimately the nucleus. 
all right, where you have a, a response. You're going to have a change that's induced through this original interaction. All right, so this particular growth factor could, for instance, the response would be an increase in uh, growth rate, for instance. Or it could be a stimulation for growth. All right, so again, the signaling molecule is referred to as a ligand, and it binds to a very specific receptor molecule embedded in the membrane of the cell. All right, so whenever this ligand binds to its receptor, you have a change in the shape of the receptor molecule, which is going to trigger this signal transduction pathway. All right, so for instance, we're going to look at uh, tyrosine kinases, all right, since we're going to ultimately be looking at a phosphorylation, dephosphorylation pathway, this particular signal transduction pathway or um, process of ligand binding to its protein receptors makes the most sense, all right. There are other, other types of membrane proteins like G proteins and um, ion gated proteins that are important, all right, we're just not going to talk about them, all right, because I want you to focus on just phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, okay, because it applies to this context of the cell cycle. All right, so this gives you kind of an overview of the steps that are involved. We're going to walk through each individual one, all right, in this, in this original interaction, all right, so here we're going to have the reception where your ligand, your signaling molecule, like a growth factor, binds to a ligand binding site on this receptor protein. So it's a membrane bound protein. All right, so tyrosine. Tyrosine is an amino acid. You have receptor tyrosine kinase proteins. All right, so right now these proteins are inactive. All right, because they can be phosphorylated. All right, so here our signaling molecule binds to these proteins. These two proteins, tyrosine kinases, bind together. All right, they they dimerize. All right, dimer implying that you have two. They fuse together. All right, this kind of helps, you know, propagate and encourage this signal transduction to help amplify it. All right, so next, once you have your ligand bound to your tyrosine protein kinase molecule in the membrane, all right, you have to have your phosphorylation reaction. So ATP transfers the phosphate group through a hydrolysis reaction. All right, so this stuff's going to keep coming back up. All right, so we're going to talk about hydrolysis. We're going to talk about condensation reactions. All right, so here, your ATP molecule gets hydrolyzed. That phosphate group off the ATP gets transferred to this protein kinase molecule. All right, so this is a process of phosphorylation. All right, so now this receptor protein complex with the ligand bound is completely activated. All right, it is primed to transduce the signal to the nucleus. All right, so here you have other proteins that will interact and relay this information. All right, so they'll, they'll interact the, with these little phosphate groups bound to these tyrosine molecules, these tyrosine amino acids. All right, so now, following this, the information has to be transduced from the binding of this ligand molecule, the signaling molecule, to this membrane protein. That information now has to be transduced to a nucleus.
All right, so you have a signal transduction pathway all right, that helps to kind of spread out, amplify the signal to reach the nucleus. All right, so your book kind of makes this analogous to uh, following dominoes. All right, so the binding of your signaling molecule to this receptor is the basically the initiation of this signal transduction pathway. So it's like dominoes. You knock one over, the rest of them fall over and suit. All right, so basically you have this tyrosine molecule here that was inactive, okay? And then it's phosphorylated, it's activated. Well, this is gonna trigger a response where you have a series of inactive proteins to become activated. Right? And this is going to involve phosphorylation. All right, so inactivated, no phosphate group. Activated, phosphate group attached. If you remove or cleave a phosphate group, it's now inactivated again. All right, so you have this relay system, the signal transduction pathway. All right, so you have a protein molecule that gets activated, that protein molecule activates the next molecule in the series, and so on. In this process, we're talking about phosphorylation reactions. So you have a phosphate group that gets transferred from one protein molecule to the next. So inactivation, activation, inactivation, act activation, and so on. All right, so you have phosphorylation, dephosphorylation of proteins. All right, so this is one example of a regulatory signal transduction pathway. All right, so you have protein kinases. All right, so whenever you hear the word kinase, you need to think about phosphorylation. All right, its job is to transfer a phosphate group from ATP to some protein, some molecule. All right, so in this case, you have a series of phosphorylation reactions, one after the other. So you form this collection of reactions, this chain of reactions that we call a phosphorylation cascade. All right, so here, all right, this is our initial step. You have your signal molecule, it binds to your uh, membrane protein. That membrane protein becomes activated. Well, now, this membrane protein is activated, you have an inactive protein kinase that's going to have a phosphate group that gets transferred to it, so now it's activated. All right, this active protein kinase can transfer a phosphate group to the next protein. All right. And then you have this inactive protein kinase that gets phosphorylated. And the signal keeps getting propagated until it eventually reaches an active protein that will enter the nucleus. All right, protein phosphatases. All right, if you, hear, if you see a protein, the name of a protein, and it has the word phosphatase, this tells you that it de-phosphorylates. So you have the removal of a phosphate group. All right, so dephosphorylation, it's like a light switch, all right? If you de-phosphorylate, all right, you're effectively turning off the light. 
if you false foil it, you're effectively turning on the light. All right, so these are on-off switches, basically. You can turn on a pathway, or you can turn off a pathway, whether a protein is being phosphorylated or dephosphorylated. All right, so eventually, this information gets transduced to the to the nucleus. All right, so in this case, you have the the synthesis of genes or regulatory molecules, all right, enzymes, protein products that are produced as a result of this original interaction between your ligand and your receptor protein. All right, so you can have a transcription of genes that get turned on, or we can have transcription of genes that gets turned off or prevent it from being transcribed. All right, so in terms of tying this information in with the cell cycle, all right, there are certain signals that will effectively tell a cell to divide or to kind of hold off and wait. Sorry. So here you have, for instance, a growth factor. Growth factor binds to a receptor. That triggering of this binding of the growth factor to its receptor, that information gets relayed through a phosphorylation cascade. We have protein molecules that get phosphorylated in series. And eventually you have a transcription factor that gets activated through phosphorylation, you attach a phosphate group to it. It's going to transcribe genes into RNA. RNA is going to be translated into protein. Now this RNA could be regulatory RNA molecules as well. Effectively, it can regulate the cell cycle either way. All right, so here, looking at this event a little bit closely at this phosphorylation cascade, so you have this inactive protein kinase, you have your activated relay molecule, all right, you have phosphorylation of your protein kinase, it's phosphorylated. All right, here, your inactive protein kinase 2 will be phosphorylated. And then here, an active protein kinase 3 gets phosphorylated. And in the process, you can also have a dephosphorylation reaction, where your active protein kinase will be dephosphorylated back to its inactive form. All right. Eventually, this phosphorylation cascade transfers a phosphate group to your inactive protein, which functions as a uh, transcription factor. All right, so here, all right, you're looking at the effect of external signals on frog egg cells. All right, so here you have the question of is M phase or metallic phase controlled by uh, regulatory molecules in the cytoplasm of the cell? All right, so researchers are hypothesizing that cytoplasmic regulatory molecules control 
whether or not the cell will enter or not enter the mitotic phase. All right, so here you have two set, you have two cells. All right, one cell is in the mitotic phase. All right, so they remove samples from the cytoplasm, the cytosol, the liquid portion from your cell in mitosis. And then you have another cell, egg cell, that's in interphase. They remove cytosol from that. All right, so they inject oocytes with either of these two solutions. All right, so the egg cell is injected with the cytoplasm from the cell in mitosis is going to enter mitosis. This triggers the cell to begin mitosis. All right, even if it was originally an interface, these signals trigger to enter mitosis. All right, but a cell that's receiving signals that's still an interface, all right, so here you have your cell is, is injected with cytosol from your interphase cell, it remains an interphase. All right, so there are certain soluble molecules all right, in the cytoplasm that trigger whether or not a cell remains an interphase or moves on to mitosis. All right, so looking at this experiment a little bit more closely. All right, so you have your experiment one, you have the synthesis phase, you have D1. Here, experiment two, you have M phase and G1. All right, so if you have a cell that's in S phase of interphase, all right, and you transform the, transfer the fluid cytosol from this cell to this one. All right. It would trigger this cell to immediately enter the S phase where DNA synthesis takes place. All right. So there are soluble factors in this cytosol, the S phase cell, the interphase, that will trigger this G1 cell to transition into the S phase. All right. Here you have a cell in the mitotic phase, right? If you were to transfer cytoplasmic fluid into this cell here, it triggers this cell to enter the mitotic phase. All right, so there are basically soluble factors in the cytosol that tell the cell, hey, we need to transition from G1 to S. We need to transition from G2 to mitosis. All right, so there are signaling molecules that can be endogenous or exogenous signaling molecules that trigger a cell to transition from interphase to mitosis. All right, so when you're looking at the cell cycle, there are a series of checkpoints, all right, that a cell has to basically pass through. So think of these checkpoints as physical checkpoints, all right? You're driving along the road. Along that road, you have checkpoints that cops stop you at, all right? So the cell has certain checkpoints it has to stop at in order to move on in terms of its cell cycle. Now, there are two regulatory molecules that are involved in, right now, the, one, the ones we're going to talk about. Um, in terms of regulatory molecules involved in controlling the cell cycle, we have cyclins, 
and cyclin dependent kinases or CDKs. All right, so cyclin dependent kinases are by themselves inactive. All right, but when they combine with the protein molecule cyclin, they form something called maturation promoting factor or MPF. The activity of this particular protein complex of cyclin and CDK or MPF is going to regulate the transition from interphase into mitosis and also regulate the transition from mitosis back into eventually cell division and interphase. All right, so there are three important checkpoints. All right, there's a G1 checkpoint, a G2 checkpoint, and a M phase checkpoint. All right, so if a cell receives the signals it needs to during G1, it's more times than not gonna transition from S to G2 pass through the G2 checkpoint, make its way into mitosis, pass through the mitotic che checkpoint, and mitosis completes and the cells divide. All right, so the most important checkpoint is this G1 checkpoint. Now, certain cells of the body, all right, don't receive the necessary signals to get the go ahead, all right. They enter this kind of quiescent static state, all right? They still do their normal job, their function, but in this case, they very rarely complete the cell cycle, all right? So things like um, neurons or uh, liver cells, all right, will enter this G0 phase, this non-dividing state. All right, they're still active, but they're just not dividing, actively dividing. All right, so here you're looking at the various checkpoints. All right, so here you have your G1 checkpoint. All right, so if the cell doesn't receive the, the go-ahead signals, all right, it's a red light, it's a blockade, all right, that cell will enter this non-dividing state, this G0 state. All right, now if it receives the necessary signals, it'll, the gate's lowered, the cell will then duplicate its DNA, and it will then be blocked by this G2 checkpoint. Now, if it receives the necessary signals to bypass the G2 checkpoint, all right, it'll enter the process of mitosis, and then during this transition into metaphase, right, you have your metaphase checkpoint, your M checkpoint. whereby the cell has to make sure that every single chromosome is lined up along the midline of the cell. Every single chromosome, every single kinetochore on each sister chromatid has a spindle fiber attached to it. Now if it receives the go ahead, all right, it'll transition to anaphase. If it doesn't, it's halted in 
basically metaphase. All right, so in terms of signals, if you have chromosomes that don't have the appropriate spindle fibers attached, this is a signaling that, hey, the cell needs to stop. All right, and it, it needs to fix, correct the mistakes, or it needs to potentially kill the cell. That's kind of the last resort though. You also have external signaling factors, like growth factors, that stimulate cell division, or platelet-derived growth factors. And then you also have the cells themselves, all right? So the population of our cells, all right, there's a density-dependent inhibition, all right? So as the cells begin dividing and become more numerous, all right, within a given given area. All right. As they become too crowded, the cells are interacting with one another, physically touching one another, they stop dividing. At least normal cells stop dividing. Replication of animal cells usually occurs only when specific growth factors are present. There are many types of growth factors that can be produced in a body to stimulate cell division. If the right growth factor is present for a given cell type, it will match up precisely with a specific cell surface receptor and bind to it. The binding of a growth factor to a receptor starts production of signals within the cell. Typically, this within-cell signaling system is a protein kinase cascade, a series of reactions where phosphate groups are passed along to different regulatory proteins in the cell. Ultimately, the cascade ends with phosphorylated proteins entering the nucleus and interacting with regulatory proteins there. The typical result is that some specific proteins are freed to activate genes for cyclins and cyclin-dependent protein kinases, CDK. The cyclin and CDK proteins then act to stimulate cell division. Cell growth and division are divided into phases. Cells grow during the G1 phase and the genome replicates during the S phase. During the G2 phase, cells continue to grow and prepare for cell division. During the M phase, mitosis occurs. Cytokinesis, C, is the phase when the cytoplasm divides, creating two daughter cells. Three principal checkpoints control the cell cycle in eukaryotes. The G1 checkpoint makes the key decision as to whether the cell should divide, delay division, or enter a resting stage. The G2 checkpoint assesses the success of DNA replication and triggers the start of the mitosis, M, phase. If this checkpoint is passed, the cell initiates the beginning of mitosis. The accuracy of mitosis is assessed at the M checkpoint. This checkpoint occurs during metaphase and triggers the exit from mitosis and cytokinesis and the beginning of G1. At the G2 checkpoint, cyclin-dependent kinases, CDKs, phosphorylate histones and proteins that carry the cycle past the checkpoint into mitosis. During G2, the cell gradually accumulates G2 cyclin, also called mitotic cyclin. The cyclin binds to CDK to form a complex called MPF, mitosis promoting factor. When the level of MPF exceeds the threshold necessary to trigger mitosis, the G2 phase ends and mitosis begins. One of many functions of MPF is to activate proteins that destroy cyclin. As mitosis proceeds to the end of metaphase, CDK levels stay relatively constant, but G2 cyclin is degraded, causing progressively less MPF to be available and initiating the events that end mitosis. After mitosis, the gradual accumulation of new cyclin starts the next turn of the cell cycle. The G1 checkpoint is thought to be regulated in a similar fashion, 
The level of G1 cyclin increases and associates with cyclin-dependent kinase, CDK. Eventually, a threshold ratio that triggers the next round of DNA replication is reached. The cyclin is degraded and the cycle begins again. Okay, so looking at the cyclin CDK interaction and how it regulates the cell cycle. All right, so you'll see that during the cell cycle going from G1 S to G2 to mitosis all the way through cytokinesis. All right, you'll see that the mitosis or maturation all right, so MPF, all right, we can call this mitosis, or we can call this maturation uh, promoting factor. Okay. You can see that the, the levels of this maturation promoting factor increase as the cell goes from G1 to S to G2. And that during this process of somewhere in mitosis, cyclin decreases. All right, so cyclin, it begins to decrease in concentration, all right, basically during metaphase, all right, it's gonna be degraded. And so the levels go back down. All right, and this triggers the cell to go from my, from metaphase to anaphase. It completes the rest of the mitosis, completes cytokinesis, and then the cells enter interphase again. All right, so cyclin all right, is a regulatory protein. It cyclin, all right, it cycles. All right, so that's what you're seeing here. All right, cyclin concentration increases, decreases, increases, decreases. All right. The concentration of CDK, all right, so your mitosis promoting factor CDK, or cyclin-dependent kinase, all right, is going to remain constant in the cell, all right, is expressed at the same level. That protein is produced at the same level, whether our cell is in interphase or mitotic phase. It's always made at the same level. All right, so the only thing that's regulating the mitosis promoting factor, this MPA factor, is the amount or level of cyclin. All right, so here, During G1, you have very low levels of cyclin, as you can see here. In purple, very low levels of cyclin. All right, as a cell transitions from G1 through S to G2, all right, the levels of cyclin increase in the cell. All right, so G1, S, G2, the levels of cyclin increase in concentration. Okay. So as more cyclin is being made, that means that more cyclin is actually interacting with CDK to form your protein complex, this mitosis promoting factor. All right. So it would make sense that at this point where it peaks, as the cell transitions from G2 to the mitotic phase, all right, this is when your MPF activity is gonna be at its highest, it peaks, all right? So there's a, there's a certain threshold, a limit that has to be reached. There has to be a certain concentration of MPF made for the cell to transition from G2 into the mitotic phase. Now once the cell enters this mitotic phase, 
all right, during metaphase, cyclin is degraded, and that means that your mitosis promoting factor concentration decreases over time. So you have a decrease in the concentration of cyclin, all right, going from mitotic phase. So this M phase checkpoint. All right, this M phase checkpoint. All right, if everything's A okay, the cell will begin to degrade the cyclin, and the cell will then go from metaphase to anaphase. Cyclin's degraded, and the whole process starts over again. All right, so cyclin cycles. It accumulates during interphase and is, in, it is then degraded during the mitotic phase. All right, and this regulates how the cell will transition from interphase to mitosis. All right, so here you're looking at the specific checkpoints. All right, so our four, first checkpoint is a G1 checkpoint. It makes make sure makes sure that the cell uh, is of an appropriate size. All right, that the cytoplasmic volume content has increased. That there is enough nutrients necessary to allow for this, the continuation of the cell as it makes its way from through interphase into mitosis. That there are certain signals present that trigger certain growth factors that are signaling the cell to enter the S phase. And that the DNA isn't damaged. So the cell is making sure that there are no damaged portions of a DNA because you don't want to make copies of damaged DNA or if DNA is damaged if you try to replicate it that replication process is halted and the cell will eventually if that can't be repaired be killed all right so it's best to correct any damage to the DNA first and then replicate it all right now some cells don't pass this checkpoint. They enter, enter the G0 state, the little quiescent kind of dormant state, where they're still active, but they don't divide. All right, the G2 checkpoint. All right, so now the number of chromosomes has duplicated. All right, the cell makes sure that there's no um, errors in DNA replication. All right, the DNA is undamaged. And by this point in time, you have your threshold limit of MPF. All right, so you're going through this process. All right, cyclin is increasing in concentration as you go from G1 to S to G2. And eventually you make a certain concentration threshold that must be reached in order for the cell to transition from G2 into mitosis. All right, so the cell has to have a certain number or amount of MPF. All right, so this M phase checkpoint. All right, so here the cell is making sure that each spindle fiber is attached to its kinetic core on its sister chromatid. All right, because you don't want to separate your sister chromatids and they not have a spindle fiber attached because then you end up with daughter cells with one too few or one too many chromosomes. All right, so you end up a process of aneuploidy. Um, or you also want to make sure that your your separase enzymes are functioning appropriately to basically cleave 
that cohesin protein to separate your sister chromatids from one another. All right. You want to make sure that your chromosomes separate properly. All right. That you don't have chromosomes that are sister chromatids that are still attached to one another during anaphase. And that the level of MPF is actually decreasing in concentration. All right, because the cyclin is being degraded. All right, so kind of transitioning and tying this in with cancer. All right, so let's say there is DNA damage that takes place. Well, you have a, a factor called P53. All right, and if it detects DNA damage, basically P53 will detect any single-stranded DNA. All right, and single-stranded DNA is indicative inside of a cell that there's some kind of damaged DNA. This will cause the cell cycle to stop, arrest. The DNA damage will, if it can be, it will be repaired, and then the cell will move on and continue the cell cycle. If it can't be repaired, it'll enter a process called apoptosis, which is basically suicide for the cell. Now, if you have a mutant P53 protein, all right, this means that it won't detect the DNA damage, the cell cycle won't be arrested, the DNA won't be repaired, and the cell will replicate without any kind of control. All right, so P53 is a, a tumor suppressor protein. All right, that's a product of a tumor suppressor gene. All right, so tumor suppressor genes encode for tumor suppressor proteins, which regulate the cell cycle. All right, so they suppress the formation of tumors. They, they suppress the formation of cells that begin to divide unchecked. All right, so an inactivation or mutation or damage to DNA within the gene or genes of tumor suppressor genetic regions all right, can inactivate that tumor suppressor gene and cause a normal cell to become cancerous. All right, so these tumor suppressor genes, they can basically halt and stop a cell from responding to external or internal stimuli that would normally tell the cell, hey, replicate. All right, so here you have a growth factor binding to a receptor. That information gets transduced to signaling enzymes like your phosphorylation cascade, which triggers a transcription factor to transcribe genes, like for instance, cyclin, to promote the cell cycle. Well, in this case, your tumor suppressor genes stop this process at many checkpoints, all right, to kind of hold the cell and arrest it so that the damage can be repaired or the cell can be killed, all right? So basically, by killing one poorly functioning cell, all right, that the DNA is damaged and it could potentially become cancerous all right, you're basically benefiting the rest of the cells in doing this. All right, so talking about normal cells and cancer cells. All right, so normal cells, they exhibit anchorage dependency, meaning that they will begin to divide when they're attached to a solid surface. All right, so they have to be attached to something in order to divide. All right.
Um, they also exhibit density dependent inhibition, meaning that when the population levels of the cells reach a certain point, when it becomes so crowded that cells are basically one on top of one another, they stop dividing. And then they also require growth factors to stimulate division. All right, so here you have cells, all right, like uh, for instance, you could have macrophages or fibroblasts or whatever type of cell you want to look at. You could have it in a, a petri dish, a plate that's coated so these cells can attach to the surface, all right, so you have anchorage dependency. They begin dividing, and once they fill up the entire area and come to contact one another, they stop dividing. So that if you remove cells, they'll fill the gap. Now your, your cancerous cells don't exhibit anchorage dependence, and they can also grow all on top of one another. So they don't exhibit density dependency. All right, they'll just grow one on top of another. All right, and this mass of cells will form a tumor. All right, your cancer cells will also, in the absence of growth factors, they can divide. All right, so cells require growth factors to divide. Your cancer cells can do one of two things. All right, they can bypass the need for those growth factors, all right, through mutations, or two, they can alter the pathway needed for those growth factors and synthesize them on their own. All right, cancer cells can also promote angiogenesis. All right, they can promote, in terms of a tumor, they can promote the formation of blood vessels to the tumor so that that tumor is receiving nourishment, it's receiving the necessary growth factors and proteins and carbohydrates it needs for those cells to grow and divide. All right, so it's basically a vampire. All right. <clears throat> All right, so cancer cells. They make their own growth factors. All right, they can basically create a signal without a growth factor being present. So they can basically, in the absence of a growth factor, signal a pathway to turn on, in terms of a signal transduction pathway. All right, so in this case, the cell cycle isn't being appropriately controlled. Now, your cancer cells, all right, going from a normal cell to a cancer cell. All right, we call this process transformation. All right, so typically cancerous cells get removed by our immune system. All right, so things like uh, T cells, all right, so you have, for instance, cytotoxic T cells. And you also have something called natural killer cells. All right, both these guys are lymphocytes and they both target cancer cells. Now, if you have abnormal cells that remain and form a tumor at the original site where it forms, it's benign. All right. Now, malignant tumors will actually become systemic. They metastasize. All right, so in this case, the cancer cells will basically spread to other parts of the body and form other tumors in other areas. All right, so they migrate. All right, so here you have a single tumor that grows from a single cancerous cell. So you have a mass of cells, a tumor. Now, not all tumors are cancerous. Okay, so that's important to make the distinction of. Not all tumors are cancerous, all right? Now, as these cells begin to invade neighboring tissues and spread to other areas through the blood vasculature or the lymphatic system, all right, they can be spread to other areas of the body. So they metastasize. 